this is it. The new 6.2-liter V8 diesel engine that you're going to be seeing in Chevrolet's CK10, 20, and 30 series trucks. It'll be used in conventional two- and four-wheel drive, one-half, three-quarter, and one-ton models for 1982. You'll be seeing it in Blazers, Suburbans, pickups, and chassis cab models. Today, I'm going to cover some of the highlights of this new engine to familiarize you with it. I'll also show you a few things concerning service on the engine. However, the reference booklet that is included with this program contains more service information on the 6.2. After you've finished viewing this portion of the program, read through the booklet and see exactly what is different in the way of service about this engine. First, this is a new engine. It is not based on any existing General Motors truck or passenger car engine. Now, when I say it's new, I don't mean that this is a completely revolutionary new engine that has concepts and designs that you've never seen. No, a diesel engine is a diesel engine. It has pistons, valves, a crankshaft, camshaft, and other familiar components. When I say that it's new, I mean that it's not a beefed-up version of an existing engine. In fact, there is nothing interchangeable between this engine and any other GM engine. Construction-wise, this engine is heavy-duty for heavy-duty applications. Now, let's spend a few minutes looking at some of its design features. The 6.2 is a V8 with a 90-degree configuration. It is a four-cycle operation and naturally aspirated, meaning it doesn't have a turbo for air induction. It's an over-square design. That is, the bore is larger than the stroke. This assists in reducing engine friction. Specifically, the bore is 101 millimeters, or 3.98 inches, and the stroke is 97 millimeters, or 3.80 inches. This gives an overall displacement of 6,217 cubic centimeters, or 379.4 cubic inches. The compression ratio for this engine is 21.5 to 1. The resulting torque is 240 foot-pounds, and the engine develops 130 net horsepower. One of the design features adding to the efficiency of this engine is the pre-combustion chamber, which is located in the cylinder head. This pre-combustion chamber, which is of the Ricardo Comet 5 design, is highly efficient and has excellent emission control characteristics. Here's another design feature. The cylinder heads have five bolts positioned around each cylinder to provide a more effective seal. The crankshaft is made of nodular iron with deep rolled undercut fillets for improved fatigue life. In addition, the crankshaft utilizes an external torsional damper to reduce vibrations. Each main bearing cap is retained with four bolts in order to provide a more rigid support for the crankshaft and minimize stress. A combination intake manifold and crossover is used on the 6.2. It is a spider air plenum type which allows it to be completely separated from the coolant system. This permits removing the intake manifold without disturbing the coolant system. Removal and installation of the intake manifold is pretty straightforward without any special instructions. Roller hydraulic valve lifters are also included in the 6.2. This type of lifter is designed for low friction, not only reducing wear on itself, but also on the camshaft. Incidentally, the camshaft is made of forged steel. Here's an area where extra care is required during service. It's important that the lifter guide plates are properly installed. Otherwise, the lifters will not operate freely. As shown here, the guide plate and lifter must be positioned so that the lifter does not bind on the edge of the plate. After installing the guide plates and clamps, rotate the crankshaft two complete revolutions so that the camshaft is rotated 360 degrees. This will ensure that the lifters are operating properly. Here's something else important to take note of. The push rods have a different degree of hardness at each end. You can't tell the difference in hardness by just looking at them, so they could accidentally be installed the wrong way. If they are installed incorrectly, the softer end will wear faster than normal, resulting in an engine malfunction. To make sure that you install them correctly, mark the top of the push rods as soon as you remove them from the engine. Use a marker or paint and mark them near the top as I've done here. Make sure that you keep the paint off the end of the rod. By the way, replacement rods will be marked to identify the top of the rod. Here is something else that might look familiar to you. 
since it is also in use on another General Motors diesel engine. This is the EPR, or Exhaust Pressure Regulator Valve. If you're not familiar with this valve, which is located here at the exhaust, its function is to increase exhaust pressure during idle in order to increase the EGR flow to the engine. Needless to say, it's only used on those engines equipped with an EGR system. The EPR valve is normally open. To control the EGR system, an electro-vacuum system closes the EPR valve and opens the EGR valve. An electrical switch which controls the vacuum to the EPR and EGR valves is mounted here on the fuel injection pump. On those engines that are used in heavy duty applications, if the vehicle is not equipped with an EGR system, but is equipped with an automatic transmission, a vacuum switch will be in this position. Both types of switches are adjustable. Refer to the service manual for the adjustment procedures. Over here are the oil cooler connections. The oil cooler tubes run from these two connections. Now this one being for the pressure line and this one being for the return line to the radiator oil cooler assembly. Oil leak potential is reduced because these connections are integral with the engine block rather than having to use an adapter. As you know, one of the most frequently heard complaints about a diesel engine has to do with cold weather starting. To reduce these complaints, the 6.2 comes equipped with a block heater for cold starts in severe weather. This heater preheats the engine coolant, making it easier for the glow plugs to perform their function. A fuel line heater is also included on the 6.2. This is a thermostatically controlled resistance type heater that is positioned so that it heats the fuel before it enters the secondary fuel filter. Functionally, this heater is very similar to what's already in use on another GM diesel. Another condition which is critical to diesels concerns water in the fuel tank. An in-tank water sensor is provided on the 6.2 and is connected to a warning light on the instrument panel. When the sensor detects water in the fuel, a signal is sent to the instrument panel warning light. The water can then be drained by using a siphon valve that is located in the underside of the vehicle chassis. Since I've mentioned the fuel system, let's discuss that system for a few minutes. In a gasoline engine, the quality of the fuel is important, but not nearly as critical as it is in a diesel engine. Water or any type of contaminant in diesel fuel can create quite a problem in the operation of the diesel engine. To remove contaminants from the diesel fuel system, the 6.2 is equipped with two fuel filters. This is the primary fuel filter and it is mounted on the bulkhead in the engine compartment. You may have noticed that this is the same type of filter that is used on larger trucks. Right here at the bottom of the filter, a water drain valve permits draining water that is caught by the filter. Open this valve and the one on top until all the water is drained out. Then make sure that you close both valves. Fuel moving through the fuel system flows from the primary filter through the fuel line to a secondary filter just ahead of the injection pump. This secondary filter further guards against contaminants entering the fuel injection pump. By the way, when replacing either this filter or the primary one, fill the filter with fuel before installing it. And this is the Rusamaster fuel injection pump. The operation of this pump is very similar to pumps used on other GM light duty diesels. I'm going to take a few minutes and go through the pump removal procedure. Since this is a new engine and the pump removal is different from other engines that you may have serviced, I think you'll find this information useful. Mike here will go through the steps as I describe them. Okay, Mike, let's start. The first step is to loosen and remove the fuel lines from the secondary fuel filter. As soon as these lines are disconnected, cap them to keep them clean. In fact, make sure that whenever you disconnect any fuel line, you immediately cap the end of the line. Next, remove the two attaching bolts for the secondary fuel filter bracket and remove the filter and bracket from the intake manifold. By the way, if you were just going to change the secondary fuel filter, you'd follow these same two steps. After removing the filter and bracket from the manifold, you could then put the bracket in a vise and replace the filter. 
Okay, after you've removed the fuel filter, remove the intake manifold bolts. While Mike is doing that, there's one important point that I want to stress to you. As a technician, you've learned that it's good shop practice to work in a clean area and to practice cleanliness whenever and wherever possible while working on an engine. Well, when you're working on a diesel fuel system, cleanliness, whenever possible, is just not good enough. Cleanliness is mandatory when working on a diesel fuel system. Compared to a gasoline engine, cleanliness is about three times as critical for a diesel engine. Later, when I show you the precision design of the fuel injectors, you'll understand the importance of not contaminating the fuel. Okay, Mike should be just about ready for the next step. See this manifold bolt next to the vacuum pump? Before you can remove it, you must first loosen the vacuum pump and rotate it out of the way. Then you can remove the intake manifold bolt. The reason we remove the fuel filter first is to allow room to rotate the pump since there isn't room to rotate it in the other direction. After all the bolts are removed, remove the intake manifold from the engine. As soon as you've removed the manifold, install the manifold covers, which are tool number J29664. These covers are very important in order to prevent dirt from getting into the ports. Use a manifold bolt to retain the covers at each EGR port. Even though you'd normally remove the gasket, we'll leave it in place at this time. Since I mentioned the manifold bolts, a quick point about the fasteners on this engine. Most of the internal fasteners on the 6.2 are metric. However, if you have to replace a fastener on this engine, check the shop manual to make sure that it is metric and not English. There may just be an English fastener used instead of a metric one, so always check to be sure. Okay, next, disconnect all electrical wires and vacuum hoses from the fuel injection pump. Remove the oil filler pipe. Do this by removing the two nuts holding the pipe bracket. Then just pull the pipe from the engine. There is also a grommet in the hole from where you remove the pipe. Remove this grommet for better accessibility for the next step. After you've removed the oil filler pipe and grommet, three attaching bolts for the pump drive gear will be accessible. These bolts attach the pump drive gear, which meshes with the camshaft gear, to a flange on the pump. Turn the engine by hand until each bolt is aligned for better accessibility and remove the three bolts. If there is a lot of resistance to turning the engine, remove a couple of glow plugs to lessen the resistance. After the three bolts have been removed, disconnect the fuel inlet pipe from the fuel injection pump. Mark the fuel delivery lines that go to the injectors and disconnect them from the pump. Be sure that the pump and front housing assembly are aligned according to the alignment marks on them. It's possible that they are not perfectly aligned. If that's the case, you should accurately mark the pump and housing before removing the pump so the relationship between them doesn't change when you reinstall the pump. Remove the three nuts holding the pump to the front cover assembly and remove the pump from the engine. Now, for installing the pump, there are a few important points to remember. One of them is to make sure that you line up the locating pin so that it goes into the correct hole in the drive gear. Take extra care doing this. Otherwise, you'll end up with a locating pin in one of the bolt holes. Also make sure that the pump and front housing assembly are aligned according to the way you mark them. Once the pump is installed, remove the paint marks that you used for the alignments. When connecting the fuel delivery lines at the pump, connect the ones on the bottom first. If you connect the top ones first, you won't have enough room to get to the bottom ones. Complete the rest of the installation and connect all wires and hoses to the pump. The last component I want to cover in the fuel system is the fuel injector. These injectors are threaded and are removed by using tool J29873. It's important to always remove and install the fuel injector assembly by the large lower hex so as not to reduce torque on the nozzle holder assembly itself. The 6.2 is equipped with a Robert Bosch Pintle style fuel injector. As you can see in this cutaway, the Pintle portion of the injector is a needle that fits into a precision seat. The slightest particle becoming embedded in the nozzle seat will destroy that precision and lead to a malfunctioning injector. Now that's the 6.2 liter diesel service highlight story. Now take time to read through the reference booklet that's included with this program. There you'll find additional service information, including emission classes, trailer pulling and load carrying, maintenance intervals and special tools.
This program is designed to familiarize you with the Sys.2. For the latest and most up-to-date service information, refer to the Chevrolet Duramangle with the Sys.2 here, please. No, we can't open supplies.